Katie is an answer to a prayer I made in December 1979. Um, I had a big enlightenment moment where I realized how I messed up every relationship that I'd ever been in. One was by, I would sometimes not tell the truth about something, something I did or something I was feeling. And then I figured out that always led to my beginning to project onto the other person that they were not trustworthy. And then I would... (laughs) Uh, continue that projection by beginning to criticize the other person. And the whole thing was a race to occupy the victim position. You know, I would perceive myself as the victim and then my partner would say, oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) Yeah, it didn't matter which partner. I didn't remember them, but they would never say, oh, you know, I am responsible for all your misery. It's really all Uh, my fault. Yeah, (laughs) nobody ever says that. (laughs) And uh, so my partners would always respond, wait a minute, I'm the victim here. You're not the victim here. And then we'd go around and around with that. And I realized then a third thing, that every time I compromised my creativity in favor of a relationship, neither one of them ever worked out right. (laughs) Um, And I realized I only want to be in a relationship where both people are equally committed to their own creative passion. Like I'm a writer, you know, and I go in a room for two or three hours a day by myself. And if that's not okay for the other person, there's squeakiness there. And there had been in other relationships. But I figure that could be solved if I had a partner who was so passionate about her creativity that it would never occur to her to criticize mine or how much time I spend on it. So that was number three. So I I made this vow. I said, okay. I want a relationship where both people tell the truth and listen to the truth in each other, where both people take responsibility for what's going on rather than blaming, and where both people are passionately dedicated to their creativity. And here's the clincher, though. I was sitting by myself in a little my little cottage when I made that vow. There was nobody else there. But I said pretty much to the universe itself, I said, And I promise you this, I'll never settle for less. I'll be alone the rest of my life if need be, but I'll never repeat that old pattern again. Wow. That's where I planted my... That's a stake in the ground. A stake in the ground. Yes. (laughs) Well, the universe... Listened. Yeah, the universe is always saying yes. Uh, It's just that most of the time... What we're doing is something that doesn't get a yes. And, uh, and the universe is sitting there waiting for the thing to say yes to if we just kind of get it out there. And uh, so um, I, about a month later, mm-hmm. I walked in on January 9th, 1980. I walked into a room in Menlo Park, California, and there was probably 50 or 60 people in the room. And they were all gathered around in a circle, and I was going to give them a talk. And because I was there to give a talk and do a weekend seminar in body-centered transformation. And so in that room, I was kind of scanning people's energy just to see what kind of the raw material I had to And also with. where the troublemakers <laughs> might be. Yes, yes, yes. Where the people... Where were the people that had been dragged there unwillingly and all the kinds of dynamics that could come up? Well, as I was looking at people's energy fields around the room, I saw somebody and that had the most pure, beautiful, radiant energy field. Well, and I had to come back. I had kind of gone around the circle and I registered that and I had to come back and take a look and see what she actually physically looked like. Because when I'm reading energy, it's more of a diffuse field, kind of like um, the snow on a television screen, if there's no pictures on it, patterns in that snow is, is how I perceive it. And uh, But it's not, I wouldn't be able to say what the person looked like while I was reading their energy. So I, I adjusted my vision because I wanted to see what this person looked like. And not only that, she turned out to be the most gorgeous woman I've ever seen in my life. And so I made a little bow. I said, okay, whenever we get a break 
in this thing I was doing. I'm going to make arrangements to go see her and find out what her story is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take over here for a moment because when Gay came around and I saw that he was checking out people's energy, I was very interested in that because I could do that, but I'd never seen anybody else doing that. And so when he came back, my experience and what I share with people is that we had an infinite moment of recognizing each other. We just, we recognized and, and then, you know, later on, it took months to actually sort of unpack what happened in that moment. And then, you know, he ran around the rest of the circle and started talking. So he hadn't even opened his mouth yet. So when you opened your mouth, <laughs> that was it for me, because I thought this is the smartest person I have ever heard and the funniest. And that still remains true to this day. <laughs> and so at the break, I was going to go up and ask him a question. I had my question all formulated and I went and marched up there to ask him my question. And I never got the question out of my mouth because the first thing that Gay said was, I'm very attracted to you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> how delicious. And, uh, oh, that's making good on telling the truth. <laughs> so number one, I'm telling the truth. So number two, I said, uh, I would love to ask you to go out for a cup of coffee with me later. Um, but I also want to let you know that I only want to be in relationships where both people are committed to telling the truth, taking responsibility when things come up rather than blame and are both passionately dedicated to their creativity. So on those terms, would you like to have coffee with me? Oh my this God, is, I know this is all, this is all during the break. And so I got to tell you what I heard. So I, you know, I heard what you said, but what I heard was, listen, I don't care what you're doing. I want you to drop everything you're doing. And I want you to move out to Colorado. And I want you to have this adventure with me. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't, but, but, uh, but I really want you to come. So it took me about, literally about 15 seconds. Wow. And I said, how about lunch? Oh. Yes. I upped the ante. She took it to the next level. <laughs> Which matches her too, doesn't it? Like she very much ups, ups the ante. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> moment right there. Yes. Uh, oh, that's one of the greatest moments of my entire life. You know, oh. just that moment of Katie saying yes to all those levels of communication. And, uh, so we began this 44 year now adventure that has taken us around the world 30 some times and to uh, exotic locations like uh, Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit of an exotic the far years. away planet of Chicago. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we've, we've, uh, I think co-authored what, 10 or 12 books, together? 12, 12 books together. Yeah. yeah. And uh, never had a crossword during the whole thing. So um it's, uh, I can tell you that all the stuff you read about in Conscious Loving, it all works yeah. if you just do it. What I was thinking of is how much, re how much time I've taken to get free of the drama of approval and disapproval. Yes. I think this is part of what's going on here. And it's, it's entirely what goes on on social media for for I think a lot of people, you know, do they like me? Oh, they don't like me. That so um, really, what you were saying about not everybody is going to like me is a, a truth that I don't think a lot of people have actually faced and you know tried on and go, oh, you know, and how is it for me if somebody I say something I really love another another person goes, Bleh. you know <laughs> that. I remember a very profound conversation with Abby, my friend, you know, who's incredibly wise. And I was sharing something along those lines. And she said, you know, if everybody liked you, you probably would not be very interesting. It's like the people that are liked by all are right. not the ones that are trying to shake the boat and do something different and innovators. Innovators are very often not liked. Yes. So it's almost like I don't take it exactly as a pride statement at this point, but it's a little bit of like... <laughs> You don't like me? Okay, I'm doing something that doesn't fit in your box. Doesn't mean it's, you know, doesn't mean anything about what I'm doing, really. It, it's, it's it about doesn't, but, but we do, I think, are, are, in my opinion, more susceptible to that right now because of this last 15 years of the growth of social media and everybody thinking that they have a right to make a comment on anything, 
even yeah. areas that they have absolutely no knowledge of or no no experience and they don't even know you or or me or the idea and so like sometimes in in you know some of our posts and and I can never really even tell why it's this particular post there'll be this whole pile on of you know people disapproving of it you know yeah. and it's just an innocuous 140 characters about some suggestion that could enhance your relationship and so I I now have you know, I, I kind of just wonder, like, wow, uh, you know, it sort of reminds me of my cats when the weather turns, they can get a little antsy and they start running around and it doesn't have anything to do with me, but, it, right. you know, but it just definitely, you're just watching the cats go crazy. And I'm watching the cats go crazy. And, uh, and so being able to stand and enjoy my own presence when other people disapprove or don't like, or even are neutral. I mean, I think that's a, I think that's a really valuable skill for all of us. It is. And then turning my attention to, hmm, how can I turn this into creative expression? Um, You know, like, how can I play with it? How might this be of value to me? Is there anything I could learn from this? Because when you started saying that, I was going to ask you though, where did, not Zoe, what is the difference between someone like I want to take criticism if it's helpful and if it's feedback that's going to make me a better whatever speaker or any of those things? Some of it could be interesting, but I think what you just said <clears throat> handles that because it's if I ask myself, oh, that's interesting, they said that. Let's see, let's deconstruct to remove the drama, let's say, or remove the image. Right. Like, yeah, is there anything of value that I might learn here? Uh, they, I think there almost always is something, even if that is something like, I don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. This is my experience. Mm -hmm. And that where I, you know, stand in my own experience and and am able to express that. Uh, But often, you know, if the other person were able to, to do that, you know, what's there for me to learn in this, that when we would have a different interaction. Yes, and but then it would be a curiosity, and as you know, guys, yeah. you yes. talk about this wonder. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. wonder. Where is that from? Well, I wonder if there's value for me. That would lead for both sides because they could also be on their end, as you just said. He could have listened to that and be like, hmm. I do wonder if there's something in that comment that if I don't like to walk my dogs, maybe I should yell. Yeah, maybe maybe there is something there because almost always when you know, if I get really kind of. Oh, you know, a thrown by something. I know there's something in there for me. Right. That some have past experience that I took a picture of, or, yes. you know, some something that happened with some other person that I'm now putting his face on this other person. Um, and I wanted to just uh, clarify, I don't know if I've done this before, but I really experience a big difference between criticism and feedback. Oh, tell me more. Yeah. So from for... In, in in my experience, criticism is an attack on your being. Okay. So criticism, like, uh, God, what you, well, you are such a slob. Mm-hmm. Whereas feedback would be, you know, I noticed that, that, that you leave your clothes and you just drop them where they are. And when I look at that, I feel irritated and think, you know, would you please put your clothes away so I don't have to? So it's a feedback is about something measurable that could actually be changed. But if I say, God, you're just a slob, there's no way for you to actually respond to that without devaluing your being. And so I really, if I hear criticism from another person, I do my best to, to clarify that. Mm-hmm. You know, so what's the... What does that mean? Like what, what, Well, and actually, what are you, what are you seeing or hearing uh, you know, what's the actual problem here that might be able to be changed? And very often we get there, you know, it's just, I didn't like it. Or, you know, <laughs> that was weird. Or, uh, you know, what's interesting to to kind of tag along with this story, because I think it is, it has a good amount of <clears throat> the way the friend reported to me of his comment <clears throat> was that he thought I was very insensitive. <laughs> and so and that's, that's a criticism that's a, char- that's a character attack it's like yes. i'm very sensitive and i'm actually very kind and i the fact that he took what i said against him has very little to do with me and so now that i hear you i want to kind of go back to the conversation 
maybe even more with her than with him, because I don't really have a relationship with him. I don't really care. I mean, whatever, I care, but not really. And so really what I'm thinking is I'd like to talk to her about, like, for you to carry, for you to not have responded even, like, right. insensitive, like, why that, you know, there was no intrinsic insensibility in what I said at all, I don't think. I'm just remembering that over the years, I would say that for both gay and I, that that um, response to us, like, you know, boy, you're, you know, you're really tough or that's, you know, that's, you know, that's insensitive. And couldn't you be nicer? And you're that's nice. What we do is to call out what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> lots and of people lots don't of like that. <laughs> yeah, people don't like that. You're supposed to kind of cover it over and just make a little suggestion and say, you know, maybe in the future, if you approach this a little different, you know, it's a kind of tiptoe, which I believe also is a hero move. Yes. That I want to have people in my life who will be direct. Yes. I want to know what's actually going on. You know, it's one of the things I so value about you is that I know that you will share if there's something going on, you will let me know. Yes. And, and so will you. And so, and, and so, and for me, what that opens up is this flow of creativity. Yes. This flow of sharing and a kind of a we space where both of our creativity gets supported. And, you know, like I'll notice if something, you know, like you have a response to something, I'll go, oh, what just happened there? And, yes. you know, so being with each other at that deeper levels rather than, you know, at that superficial, like throwing rocks at each other. Yes. Well, oh, in, in closing, I would love to hear your thoughts on. Do, so do we do we clean up all relationships like like do you recommend like is it my I don't even know how to ask <laughs> like, I don't even know how to ask without it being like even a little hero-y possibly it's like is my do I hang up that call and I do my own little inner work or whatever and then I'm done or well, is it important for me to go back if it's a close the one in the middle, the friend is a good friend. Like it's an important Well, if it's a friend and someone with whom you want to have a deeper relationship, yes. there may be something to clarify there. I don't know if it's a cleanup because okay. I don't think there's anything to clean up. Yeah. So how would, how would a clarifying look like then? Well, for me, it would be, here was my experience. You know, I saw this and I saw that, well... He's not taking care of his dog. So maybe that means he doesn't really want to have dogs. That's And that was my thought. So I identified that was my thought. I shared my thought because that's what I was experiencing in that moment. That's real. And I don't experience any need to defend that because that's what happened. And so, uh, and this is really at the crux of transformation. One of the things that Krishnamurti uh, said, who's, you know, a, a... Um, long gone, but a very active mentor for us is that all you need to do to find out what your intention is, is to look at the result. Okay. So like the, if I intended uh, to, uh, to let you know that something, uh, that I was hurt by something, but I don't actually tell you I was hurt by what you said, but then later on I spill something on you. Yes. And 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 you go, what happened there? And I go, oh, oh, well, so sorry. You know, I just spilled something. You rather than looking at, oh, mm. I didn't share this with you, and then I spilled something on you. So I'm letting my body communicate rather than communicating with you in a straightforward way. I remembered coming to your house to a party many years ago. I think it was a party for Christmas. And you had a, a note on the wall that said, leave the small talk at the door. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, we had a little menu for people who who wanted to experiment with having what we call big talk uh, of having a, a conversation that allows us to actually connect more deeply rather than, hi, how are you? How are the kids? What are you doing? How's you know? the Right. So that kind of a, you know, a bounce off or what we sometimes call fly by love that you're you're not really oh, getting that nourishment of connection. And so the uh, what we've been focusing on for many years is how can our conversations with each other be a source of nourishment? 
uh, and a, a source of deeper connection and also play. So we had we had little prompts like, um, you know, what's uh, what's the most interesting thing you've learned today? Or uh, what are you looking forward to, but also maybe kind of scared of? So it, it allowed people to stretch themselves a little bit without going, oh, my God, I'm in an encounter group or something. <laughs> Now, I remember, it's funny, I think we are wired humans, maybe we wired differently, because to me, small talk is what's really scary. Like, I do not know how to do, I mean, more than 35 seconds, you know, just like. Yeah, oh. That's one of the things I love about you, Sophie, is that I don't ever have to you know, worry about, okay, now we have to go through that. Uh, what I was just remembering is I used to teach in Berlin and um, and, and in Germany, and I didn't know the language, but I could hear the tone of when when my friend was having conversations, she would pick up the phone and there would be like actually five minutes of that. And then I hear them shifting into, OK, now we're getting to the business of the conversation. And then at the end, there was another five minutes of the And I thought, whoa, that's, uh, you know, that's a whole the difference. Yeah, I could really feel the difference. And and for me, the I like to just get right to it. Like, okay, what's the business? What what's the communication? Because it also allows me to use my whole self to respond rather than, okay, we are waiting till we uh, you know, get through it. I think that is also part of a I think it's fear-based in a way, like if we have this. We have a ritual and, you know, it's like you come and you knock on somebody's door and you wait for them to come and open it. You just don't barge in. Yes. Uh, but uh, my friends can barge in. We barge in. And you and I barge yeah. in. <laughs> we <love> that. <laughs> I remember being on a date many years ago, not that many, maybe, I don't know, 10 years, 10 years ago. And I remember sitting and the very, I don't know, 20 minutes of like, so where do you go on vacation and what kind of music? Yeah. Like, yeah, I, what's your I could, favorite food? And <laughs> I could feel my energy just going like, war, war. it was just like bored and bored more. And at some point he says he wants to go to the bathroom. And I remember summoning my, my, my courage and said, maybe when you come back, we could have a meaningful conversation. Like maybe when you come back, because if not, I think we may not be, I, mean, I was very, you know. And did he come back? He did. <laughs> Can you imagine if he escaped out the window? That's what I was thinking. He goes to the bathroom and you never see him again. <laughs> Not at all. He sat down and he said, my mother died yesterday. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, if that's what's present for you, we should talk about that. Because he literally was covering that up with like, you know, a pony show. Oh. And oh, we had the most beautiful that. conversation. I didn't end up dating him regardless, but it was just, I remember this moment of like, you're feeding me air. Like, don't like give me something. Yeah, I'm not something. getting any, there's no nourishment here. Well, I love it. What I was getting from what you were just saying is that we can, uh, we can be an, a door opener for, yes. for people to, to be able to go deeper. And it was reminding too. one of, one of my students the other day was saying that he was feeling so frustrated because he was having lots of connections with people, but it, it felt kind of superficial to him or on the surface. Yeah. And he was really wondering, how do I go deeper? And I think that's what you were also uh, posing to your, you know, to your date. My there, potential date. A better <laughs> word of how can we go deeper? And, and I do think that that's, for me, that's one of the things that uh, has uh, encouraged me to have these conversations with you. Because I, I experience with you that there's something about our presence together that allows me to go to whatever is emerging and not have to cover anything up. And I love that. And I would like everybody to have the experience of you can just be yourself and share what's actually going on and what you're thinking and feeling and wondering about. Do you think what makes people, you said fear is one of the factors. Do you think people are afraid of, of sharing too much about themselves or what do you oh, think? Oh, yeah. I think that people are afraid uh, that they're going to be judged, um, that what they're feeling, there's something wrong with. Because we also, in our culture, we have this whole attitude toward feelings. Um, and you know, feelings themselves are sort of 
You know, we should be able to just eat them from, yeah, out of the conversation. Everything would work so much better. You know, I, I remember a couple who came in to see me for a therapy years and years ago. And his goal was that uh, she said, I would love for us to be able to have deeper conversations with each other. And he said, well, what I really want is that she's able to serve dinner on time. And this was the, <laughs> the difference. What century are we talking? <laughs> exactly. That's what. I mean. wow. So the, the <clears throat> expectations of the culture, but I think also people, um, I think most people feel that they're not quite right, or there's something that's wrong with them and people are going to find out. And if I, if I say something, they're going to find that out about me and then they'll leave me and I won't be. I won't have any company or I won't be lovable. I think at the root of that is there's something fundamentally unlovable. And so when I'm with people and I, I can see when feelings are emerging and if I, and I, I open myself to, okay, something is wanting to emerge here and I'm willing to receive it. And they get that from me and then they can drop right into what, what's really present and there's something to me that's just one of the most delicious experiences in the world is hearing someone else's authentic self yeah. just expressing. I find that, you know, that's better for me than uh, I often forget to eat, actually. If I'm having those kinds of conversations with people over food, yeah. I get so nourished by that that I go, oh, right. And there's food here, but it yes. it doesn't have the same quality that it used to have. Like, you know, I have to eat something because I'm not getting anything from the person, you know, or from our conversation. Or possibly even deeper from ourselves, because as you just described, we can bring the conversation to a deeper place. I don't think I knew how to do that before. And so even if I knew I wanted that, I, I couldn't really create it. And so food was giving me a like, a, okay. Let's, yeah, know, let's it gave you something. something that, you know, felt like it might be nourishment. The other thing that was just occurring to me is that the co-creation, which we're calling play, yeah. which in a way is really the, the tossing back and forth, and then something else happens. A third thing starts yes. to happen where we can both drop into, you know, old memories or what this is connected to or what we really want or a whole new vision like oh, that just reminded me, you know, I want to, you know, create this whole new thing. And uh, I, I think that that's part of the, the nourishment of creativity that comes from allowing ourselves to go deeper. I was also just thinking that in my body, I can open that by letting myself breathe more deeply. I can open my body because I think a lot, we don't notice it, but a lot of times our bodies are not really open to the the deepening because we're closed off in some way, you know, that sometimes it's more obvious. But I think a lot that if if I just narrow myself a little bit, you know, and get just a little bit scared, I, that the reservoir closes up. Yeah. that, And also maybe there's a, people are uncomfortable with the pause, like I was just noticing that you you kind of paused, and I could have gotten there, but I could see yeah. that there was more you wanted to say, and but I was comfortable with that, including exactly. the fact that maybe you had nothing to say, and that was fine. We could have a pause, <laughs> but I do think that when people are in conversation, they are wanting to avoid. If let's say they notice that the other person is having a feeling, they'll they'll speed up to like not. They don't want to deal with the other, or they don't know how to deal with the yes. Right. Like maybe it's not a not wanting to, because I don't think people don't care by, but I do think that it makes people squirmy. Like, oh, she's tearing up a little bit. Oh, like, let me get out of this. Like, oh, oh, dear. I've got to do something. And oh, oh, my, maybe it's something I did. Exactly. I think you're really onto something with the, the, I notice in my conversations and the conversations that I observe with others is can people leave a pause? Mm -hmm. And uh, the opposite of that is interrupting, which I, you know, which I see, you know, in, in, uh, on television, a lot of that modeling of you just speak over the other person. And that's not really a conversation or a tossing. That's like a competition of, you know, and it feels like, you know, climbing to the top of the heap. But if I can be just in that pause, 
there's that sense of letting something emerge, mm-hmm. you know, and having the rhythm of, of breathing and the rhythm of, you know, like it feels to me more like a, a summer day where we're, you know, out in the backyard tossing or watching the butterflies and their silence which is also a communication that it, we don't have to put everything into words every minute, you know, because I think that gets us also into an adrenaline cycle of, you know, got to feel something in, got to keep going. Because if I, if I don't, the thing that wants to emerge is going to emerge. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really think that most people have gotten scared of, realness of uh, just the the emergence of something spontaneous, something authentic. That's really one of the things I most love about you is that I never know what's going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> I never know what's going to come out of yours. <laughs> exactly. And that, and the joy of the, oh, you know, of discovery and um, not just recycling, you know, here's what I heard. And did you watch that show last night? But mm-hmm actual what are you creating right now through your being i'm either open and growing or i'm protecting and in fear mm-hmm. and the fear of course can show up in all of these different ways you know going rigid so you know and making the rules or going completely um flighty so that um i'm never really where i said i was going to be when i said i was going to be there but mm-hmm. the counter commitment, what you can do, it's actually so simple that it's kind of frustratingly simple, is you look at the result. You look at what you're actually producing, and that will give, oh, oh, you know, so like I was remembering years ago where I, I um, had intended to kind of clear all of the debris from a past relationship. And right after I got together with Gay, one of the glasses from a past relationship fell and broke. Yeah. And I thought I had cleaned up all of the pieces of it, but then Gay stepped on one and got a cut in his foot. It wasn't bad, but you know, it was a signal for me like, hmm, hmm, I have not really let go of all of the different aspects of my last relationship. And then after a necklace that this guy had given me actually fell off it it separated fell off and broke all over the floor i got okay i got it okay uh-huh, message clear okay. i'm going to go through everything now and anything that has to do with that poof out it goes uh so you know and it can also be really simple like um you know you're intending to be more kind mm-hmm. to a close friend or to your partner and then the you know the next thing that happens is you get into a huge hassle you know, mm-hmm. over who didn't, you know, get the rest of the groceries that they were supposed to get. And, you know, it's always about something that people look back and they go, what was that fight about? No. <laughs> no. But but what it does is give you a sense that you both want to and you don't. We, we tend to think that if I don't just say, you know, I'm totally committed to this and I have no question about it, that we won't be able to do it or it's not going to be successful. But what I found is that acknowledging, you know, I both want this and I'm scared to have this. You're like, so when I got together with Gay, the the energy that got liberated, that was so thrilling to me, but it was also incredibly scary because, uh, you know, everything I thought I knew about how the world worked, you know, got challenged, uh, you know, for over a year. And so I kept looking at, you know, I want this and also... You know, it's it's challenging my whole sense of how the world works. And so a very simple thing to do is just to look at what's actually happening, which sometimes people don't. They say, I didn't mean to, which, you know, is a signal. I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to look at what's really happening. So are we saying, because I remember when I was part of the, the one of the big chunks of the weight I lost. Everybody, I dropped or whatever we say, because losing, you want to go out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember, re- I remember remembering, that's a funny sentence. I remember remembering my mother. So my mother used to be a model when I was very young and she stopped. But as I was turning into a teenager, like a cute one, I could see that she, it was also the time where she was starting to age. And uh-huh. I remember, I remember making the decision that her unhappiness about that was not worth 
Like I, I remember almost making a decision that being larger and not as pretty or whatever the thing would be, would be safer for her. Like I wanted to protect her against I'm aging, my young daughter is looking beautiful or some sort of that. And I feel like yeah. I made a this like almost like as I would be losing weight later on in life, that thing yeah, would be, which was not even relevant anymore. But that decision was almost, is that what maybe one of those, like a count? Oh, that's, so, that's such a beautiful example. Because what I'm also thinking about is, and this parallels my relationship with my mother. Uh, what you didn't mention there was her competition with you. Yeah. Which was there. Which was there. And 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 which you were aware of probably from a much younger age. Yeah. You were aware of her competition with other women, women's competition with each other, and that it's based on how you look, not who you are, what you can offer, your, you know, generosity of spirit. It's really about, hmm, oh, she's letting herself go. That was the, you know, phrase of my, you know, my parents generation would use, well, she looked good, but then she let herself go. And they never said that about men, of course. It was always men, well, he's getting, you know, he's, you know, he's filling out now that he's older, yeah. you know, or he's yeah. looking a little more prosperous, but not like, whoa, he's got, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but, but we do that, you know, the culture does that to women. Yeah. And so my sense is that, uh, that's a, such a great example of the something that you really wanted because, you know, you wanted to play with, you know, here I am now becoming, you know, a, a woman and how do I want to express myself in the world? But then the the ceiling, what we might call the upper limit was, oh, that's going to threaten my mother. Mm -hmm. and, the, and that's one of the, uh, like the, the competition and outdoing is one of the classic fears. Mm. You know, we're we're afraid of being disloyal, of um, having our love stolen by somebody else, mm -hmm. um, but also um, outdoing. And so I, I'm imagining that one or more of those came up for you, but at a level that um, you couldn't really even deal with it because it wasn't possible for you to talk to your mother about it or oh God anybody. No. No, and I and I do think it's funny that you 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 took the stand of her perception, which was she was threatening and she was jealous, you know, of the attention I was getting, and she contributed. But I, I'm gonna you know try to keep it to what was going on on my end, and it was a survival. I could see that when she was upset, and in this case, as you just said, jealous and. It was not safe for me. Like I, I would be exactly. but in danger. And so might as well, you know, not keep this, this, whatever it was, you know, this, this growing, like a shiny, shiny penny or something. Like I decided to like cover it up with mud a bit. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, um, in my, in my work with women who, who have issues with their weight and their image that they put the weight on in as a protection. Mm -hmm. a lot and then their essence can be inside there and usually i mean it's still there it doesn't go anywhere but it gets covered up well to go back to the magic piece which i think i, I really saw it as relevant here because there was no magic in the journey for me until i released those unconscious it was almost like incompatible with what my goal was and right. until it's like I, accelerator break, accelerator That's exactly what it was. I would gain 20, you know, I would lose 30, I would gain 40. It's like, it was just like, I cannot live in that other space until I release this belief that I'm going to be put in danger, you know, that my mother, which was not even relevant. That's the part that's bizarre is that it's no longer relevant, really, because at that point she had aged and I had moved out. Like, I, you know, it wasn't even relevant, but somehow... Oh, it, it is relevant. It's like, it doesn't, those are, those are what psychologists call imprints. Yeah. So they're learning that's accompanied by some kind of really strong emotional charge. Now yeah. the ones that happen really early in life, which I'm sure you also experience, okay. contribute to something that we think, well, why can't I just let go of that? You know, and then we blame ourselves for not being able to let go of it. Whereas it is actually embedded in your your whole body response to I'm not safe here. And the the very first thing that makes for having a successful human life is the experience of safety. Mm -hmm. I am going to be taken care of. People are meeting my needs. People see me. And when you get that interfered with, it puts that accelerator brake 
uh, system going that we can change, but it really does take clock time to time over cho- choosing over a period of time to slough off the you know the old conception of yourself that someone else placed on you, but also to create your own safety. And so instead of creating your safety by diminishing yourself and being no threat, to really take up your own presence and your own beauty and still be safe. Now that's magic. So, so how, that's really powerful. How do we, how do, how do I do that? When I, re- because, you know, we've had a similar mothers, you and I. Yes. Yes. And I'm I think pretty sure we're not the only. Have, there's like four or five mothers and we all share them. <laughs> Somehow. I'm pretty sure we're not the only two. So but that's what I'm if saying. We were, mm-hmm. If we were raised in an environment that, Whichever version of what we just said, we felt unsafe, we felt unseen, we felt, you know, people were jealous of us, you know, like any of those things. Being aware of it is already a great start, right? Like starting to track, ooh, I keep saying I'm not safe here. Well, now I am safe, you know, look, so how do we, what are, what are ways that one can rewrite that story or change the story altogether or read it? Mm. Well, the first thing that, that occurs to me is finding out how, I respond what my fear signature is when I feel threatened like that. Most of us need somebody else to look at us with some curiosity or kindness Mm -hmm. or just, you know, noticing us rather than what we're doing, you know, or what we're producing. And uh, it's very rare, but it's such a gift. And uh, my sense is that we don't need very many people to do that to really be able to establish that for ourselves. But most of us do need that. Like, oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. you're worthwhile. I I, see you. I remember when I went from someone would give me a compliment and I would immediately switch to some version of, well, if you really knew me, right? If you you spent more time with me, you'd realize that I'm not. And I remember later someone gave me a compliment and I, I kind of was like, oh, wait, what? Like it didn't. It didn't do the thing. It was like, yeah, you're right. I'm very kind. That that's very nice of you to notice. But there was no let me sh- let me tell you how much that's a lie that I'm a. There's nice- no bounce off. Well, that's yeah. part of I think what culture uh, teaches us to do is oh it, oh it's you know yeah. it to deflect. Yeah, and we actually um, had little. Uh, experiments with people because I can remember Gay trying to compliment someone on her apple pie. We'd gone to a party and she made this Uh apple pie and this is a delicious apple pie. She, oh, well, you know, the the crust is a little, wasn't quite right because the flour was a little old and he would say, well, oh, it's certainly the most delicious one. And she just kept deflecting. And so after four or five, he just gave up. (laughs) It was like, oh, she's really committed to not letting appreciation in. And uh, I think that's one of our big tasks right now is to receive, Mm. is to receive others' attention, to receive, oh, like that, no, just, so I'm taking you in, Sophie, and the color and uh, how the color brings forth the, you know, the vividness of your face. And I'm just taking that in and celebrating you. You haven't done anything. You're just Mm -hmm. there being you, but that's a source of nourishment. When I'm connecting with you, I can feel the essence you, and I can receive that. And then that gives nourishment to me. And I think that's a lot of what goes on in relationships that really work. We're being and loving each other. One of my favorite things I do when I work with people, mostly maybe in corporate, maybe, but maybe somewhere else as well. Like I'll notice someone comes to me and speaks about you and says, well, Katie, blah, 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 blah. And like gives me all these like compliments and all. And and then I'll say, oh, that's wonderful. Does she know you think that? And they'll be like, oh, no, no, I would never say that to them. (laughs) Say that to you. And be like, why would you not say that to them? (laughs) That's such a Right, it's sort of a positive form of gossiping. It's a bizarre, I mean, in in my childhood, I remember these moments where, If I wanted to know what my parents were thinking, particularly my mom, I would have to listen to her on the phone. And if she was mad at me, she would just be like, like blabbering about these horrible things I did and was and all. But also I would hear, you know, what she did really good in school, like some some compliment, but never, never, never to you. If I walked in the room, she would stop talking. Like there was almost like a, 
that's a no, no. Like we do not say kind things to people. <laughs> I know it's so crazy. And what you're saying reminds me of really the tragedy of my mother's life. Her mm-hmm. mother raised her without appreciation. Yeah. Well, very yeah. consciously because she didn't want her to get a big head. So, you know, I, and, and it, it created, um, so when my, when my mother, my mother had no self-confidence, yeah. had no way to really evaluate herself. And it, it created issues for her, her entire life. And it came from my, I'm sure my grandmother's wishes to have her be um, accepted in society and to right. be a good person. <laughs> but, you know, our child rearing <laughs> practices are just out, so totally screwed up, you but know, in so many areas. There was a, a documentary a while ago, and I kind of feel bad that they filmed that because whatever they did to that child, but they were, it was about trauma. And they, so you see this little baby, six months old, I mean, he sits up, you know, so maybe six months old, and it's an exchange around food and the mother's feeding and very interactive, very present, you know, feeling the feelings like the kid is happy, gives more, you know, just really, really interactive. And the kid is clearly having a beautiful time. And he's just like babbling. Like yes. Happy kid, right. And at some point, you know, directed by the experiment, they ask her to stop the connection, still feed her, still feed the baby, but no longer, you know, so put the food, pay attention to nothing, you know, just like absolutely ignore it. It takes about 45 seconds for this baby to go berserk and start. Berserk. berserk. Yeah. Absolutely. Which it tells us that trauma occurs at small, like you don't really need to be like, some people say, I wasn't beat up as a child. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> there are degrees, but you could you could feel abandoned and not seen from not so much was kind of what I took from that experiment. Well, what I also hear is that it's about the quality of attention. Yeah. I think, you know, attention, um, being seen, being attended to no. is uh, when and learning to read the signs of, you know, what the baby wants, what the baby needs. But, no. uh, oh, I think she's sleeping now. And uh, all of no. those are yeah. really about attention. Yeah. And if we don't give attention and there are all kinds of studies about what happens to us when we're when we don't have positive attention or we have neglectful attention or mm-hmm. erratic attention mm-hmm. and so one of the one of the biggest skills that i think that people can learn is how to give themselves curious attention like mm-hmm. hey how are you oh and just feeling into what are my sensations and oh. you know what what are my what emotions who has my energy today just what am I, you know, what am I noticing? And then also to, to be able to give attention clearly and directly and uninterrupted by distractions mm-hmm. is probably the, the biggest thing that can contribute to our well-being. I would imagine it's difficult to do if you don't give it to yourself a little bit. Like if yeah. I don't give myself attention, that I'd be able to be like, ooh, I'm really present with Katie. Like if I'm not present with myself, Right. Like I couldn't I really wouldn't have the skill to to do that. Well, I I think it's a (coughs) excuse me. I think it's a combination of. I need some water. Yes, please. (coughs) Okay, why don't you do that? We'll cut that moment. I want to bring some. Mm -hmm. Adi, can you try this particular minute moment so we know to cut that? So that is yeah. how I'm <laughs> Well, okay. I, I, the exchange of attention, uh, I think, is the most basic nutrient that creates happy people. Mm-hmm. And um, and I've seen like we we have some new friends who had a. A, a baby during the pandemic. And so I got to watch the evolution of really, really loving parents with their little boy. Mm-hmm. And what it really was about was an extended version of peekaboo. Wow. You know, it's really like there'll be a, um, what scientists call a bid for attention. Uh-huh. And they would respond to that. And then they would play with it a little bit. And then they would do something. And then there would be another, like, how do you want attention now? And how do, uh, so there were like, oh gosh, a thousand different versions of peekaboo. But it was really about 
I'm giving you attention in all of these different ways. And then I'm responding to the way that you are giving me attention. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, the template for our creativity, for our ability to receive, for our ability to give attention to ourselves. So we look at ourselves the way we are looked at.